Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. I have Dr. Drew Johnson with me, and today we're spe uh, specifically going to talk about his book, What Does uh, Darwin Have to Do with the Bible? I'm sorry, did I get that title right? Um, yeah, that was perfectly close enough. <laughs> perfectly close enough. All right. <laughs> sorry, and uh, I assume you're playing off of uh, Tertullian's quote, yes, What Does yeah. Athens Have to Do with Jerusalem? Yes. Yes. And so, um, you know, a, a common subject that I like to talk about on this channel when I'm not talking about Christology or early church history is uh, science and faith things. So I am an avid listener of Paul and Leitner's channel, mm. uh, Deep Talks. And uh, I became aware of you when you were on Paul's channel. And Paul was like, I was saying, you definitely need to talk to him uh, because he knows uh, Paul and I have had uh, conversations about evolution and creation yeah. and stuff. Paul like has that. tough questions. <laughs> Paul, Paul has tough questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, sometimes I've been known to be a little bit of a softball interviewer, but maybe I'll push you a little bit. Good. But, good. I hope so. I like finding the weaknesses in the argument. So, so I guess uh, before we get going, I, a, a lot of listeners like to understand uh, someone's story a little bit to understand where they're coming from. So, uh, with you know, in say five minutes ish, how did you come to be a person writing a book about science and faith and Darwin and Christianity? Uh, so it was a long time in the making. I, I originally was going to do my PhD in social sciences, research psychology, and so I was kind of interested in. So, and what I really realized in studying psychology, the, the thing I was most interested in was experiment design and statistical analysis. Not that I'm great at statistical analysis or anything like that, but I just was fascinated by um, simple things like the bell curve, like the uh, like how does this how is this true in chemistry and forest growth and like human population dynamics? And I just couldn't, you know, there's all these philosophical issues like how do you know things? How do you know things with confidence? I think that's generally true of people who come from broken homes. They have confidence issues. <laughs> so like they want to be, they want to think, you know, when things are floating throughout their childhood, that as they grow older, they kind of typically want to find ways to lock things down. So I think that was my way in of trying to lock things down. Then I went to seminary. Someone talked me into going to seminary instead of going to a PhD in psychology, which I'm glad that happened, but I still, there's a part of me that still wants to go do the PhD and in, in, <laughs> in some kind of a science, maybe even psychology. Um, or maybe probably neuroscience is probably what I would be more interested in now. But um, the and when I got into seminary, we started reading like philosophy of science stuff. And then I was like, wait, 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 wait. Nobody told me anything about, you know, I did a yeah. five years undergrad working on science and nobody told me anything about the kind of the philosophy of science and what philosophers think is going on in science. So that blew my doors open and I had to really have a rethink. And then I did another master's degree in analytic philosophy where I did some more philosophy of science and, work, and I wrote my thesis on randomness, uh, the, the concept of randomness and whether you can have an actual argument for randomness, which I decided you, you couldn't have an argument for actual random metaphysical randomness. You can only for the thought of randomness. Um, oh, man. We're going to have a lot to talk about. So <laughs> as I told you, I, I have an undergrad and master's degree in statistics. Oh, that's right. So. Yeah. So I, yeah. I love statistics and I've, I've spent a lot of time. So you probably have better philosophical questions about statistics than I do, but. Well, yeah. I, I have, I think I've taken one actual philosophy class in my yeah. entire academic, like actual credentialed academic classes, but I've always had a side interest in philosophy and feel like I'm, uh, have a lot of self-taught hours of, right. of philosophy and reading philosophers or history of philosophy books and stuff like that. And so I guess I'll jump right into this question, piggybacking off of that thought. So um, growing up, at least, uh, you know, in the mid 2000s, there was a lot of those evolution and creation debates. And I remember that being a relatively strong focal point of my faith and sort of like my teenage years was that we Christians, we don't believe in evolution. That is a Mm -hmm. boundary marker of our group. And I went to public schools and all those sorts of things. And I would read the Michael Behe books and I would have the Bazinga question for the uh, public uh, high school uh, biology teacher. And I was pretty good at that. I was pretty good at uh, being a pesky little uh, well, creation. They were probably boy. totally unprepared for, I would guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and so I remember this is one of those things that I feel like the evolutionary story was almost 
mythological in some ways mm -hmm. in that it would talk about how the creation or the the evolution process was random and that it was just random mutations that were that the creative force that generated newness and that one couldn't read any sense of purpose or greater design into it and that this this word random was doing a lot of work and you could right. say in that sort of neo-darwin story that yeah. was very popular in the early 2000s so i'm wondering what do you think of about randomness and how that fits into evolution and what we should make of that is that really a good interpretation of the science is is the can science even answer that question or is that more of a metaphysical right. question so what, what would you um, say to that well it used to be people got phds and that meant literally a doctor of philosophy in chemistry a doctor of philosophy in biology right so you had to actually understand the philosophical underpinnings of the the natural theology that you were studying um but now like you said you can get a PhD in chemistry, biology, social science, and never have taken a single philosophy class or have ever really thought philosophically about, you can just say things like, oh, it's random. And you say, well, do you mean it's a stochastic process? Or do you mean that it's a calculation meant to generate pseudo random integers? Or like, what do you actually mean by random? Mm -hmm. And, and when, I, when I wrote my master's thesis, I found out like, well, people actually mean a lot of different things and they never specify which one they mean. You kind of have to like discern from context what which kind of random they think is going on there. Kind of like with infinities, you know, Cantorian infinities, you got to figure out which infinity people are referring to <laughs> when they say God is infinitely good. You're like, well, that's actually a more complicated statement than you think. right? <laughs> so, um, so I, when it comes to, I think what you just gave, I, I should disclose, A, I became a Christian in 1994 at 20 years old. It was, I was like three years into the military then. And I, uh, although I had a Christian father, he was not in the house, in my house through most of my um, teenage year or any of my teenage years. And, uh, and my, and so I wasn't really raised in, I was raised in a Christian culture, but I was not, so I, I was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is like the thickest Christian culture in America. I think you could probably find, but I didn't really have much to do with the church at all. Didn't really have much to do with Christianity, was not interested, wasn't religious, wasn't seeking nothing. Um, and then I kind of had a radical conversion in 1994, um, and so that meaning from 1994 all the way up through, I went to seminary, finished in 2003, uh, was a pastor. But like this whole creation evolution thing was never on my radar. I, I was interested because I, I was always interested in science. I read Michael Behe's Black Box book and I was like, wow, I never thought about any of that stuff before. That's really interesting. Um, and then, of course, the first thing I did is scrub this new thing called the Internet, looking for all the best replies to Michael Behe's book, you know, because I was like, surely there's a scientist who has... And then you see, and then you watch this dismal array of really smart scientists trying to argue against what he's saying there and flopping around philosophically all over the place, not really knowing what they're talking about or never addressing his actual argument. So I was just like, put that in the back of my head, like, oh, okay, well, something, something's going on there that needs to be resolved eventually. I, I'm sure somebody will do it. Um, it was only when I worked on the randomness thesis, which was not a great master's thesis, but the, the, the idea was good, the right, the Please don't anybody look this thesis up. It was horribly written. It's got typos <laughs> all over it. Um, I was so ready to be done with it when I uh, finished it. So, um, but I think the the story, the caricature that I hear from students, especially I have students now who still, I mean, like today, they come out of a household where the, the very story that you said was from 20 years ago is actually alive and well. Mm -hmm. It's what I consider boogeyman e evolution, where it's kind of like, it's kind of like relativism, you know, they people all oh, the relative truth and all this stuff like nobody believes in relative. I haven't found a single atheist philosopher that believes in re relative truth. Right. It's just been this boogeyman for the church. Uh, Nietzsche is the closest person who believed in something like relativism, and he did not believe in relativism. Right. right? He had right. some absolute beliefs that he thought were just fundamentally good. So um, so I feel like evolution kind of operates on that plane when you talk about randomness and per no lack of purpose. Darwin does not talk about the world this way. Like if you want to, not that Darwin is the father of all things evolutionary theory, but he is certainly a, the major thing. Him and Wallace are the major thinkers that kind of steer it in the early years, steer the discussion. And, um, and so I think the, and when you look at the, the, the research on scientists themselves, the majority of scientists in America, at least North America, identify as theist of some sort, uh, religious, some religious, some Christian, some Jewish or whatever. 
but they believe there's a God and they believe there's a purpose in the universe. And so I don't know if they're doing any active reconciliation of how randomness fits in there. The, the question I addressed, it's funny, I never talked about this thesis before ever on a podcast. So you are the very first one. Um, oh, good. <laughs> so now I'm getting really nervous. Uh, the, the question with randomness is, is it just the way things seem to us or is it actually the state of the, the universe in some way? Right. And I, I was in a philosophy degree, in an analytic philosophy degree with almost entirely atheist philosopher professors. They were wonderful. Learned, I learned so much from those people. Um, and and so I wasn't like trying to take an apology. There wasn't an apologetic agenda. I was genuinely interested in this question. Um, and I so I tried to generate the best arguments I could as to how you could say something was actually random, not just that it seemed random to us, coincidental or chance like. And I couldn't generate a single one. And I couldn't and any one that I generated could easily be defeated by showing things that look like it that clearly were not random, like the, the number sequence in pi. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, so I kind of became agnostic about I, I think anybody who's looking at it philosophically would have to be openly agnostic on the idea that things are actually random and say, what is ran And you look at, and well, you're a statistician, so you do math. So, you know, the idea of randomness does a lot of work for mathematics and confirmation. It doesn't actually need to be random at all. It just needs to, uh, we just need the kind of the concept and the mathematical basis for randomness to check against chance and coincidence. Um, mm -hmm. so in some senses, like, like imaginary numbers, like a null integer like zero like infinite infinite points on a line that we don't you know i don't actually believe there are actually are infinite points on a line um i don't think most most mathematicians believe that it's just a it's a it's a a, a rhetoric or a, a heuristic as they call it a tool that gets things done in our world um and so so when people you know kind of like with a lot of things when people say well randomness means there's no meaning i'm like do you actually like quote to me who is actually saying that? And then we can address that person's claims. But I don't think most people actually think the world is, is really random to its core when they think about it. Maybe they say that, but I don't think they actually believe that. Um, or they, if they do, they believe it dogmatically as a religious belief, uh, whether they're an atheist, agnostic, or, you know, some and, type of theist. And you made a very interesting point there that there is often this implied connection between if the universe is random, or especially if the process that caused us to come to be as organisms is random, therefore things are meaningless. And mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit like, well, well, why? Right? That that seems like a jump. Um, yeah. And, and that a lot of a lot of I felt like the argument looking back, like as a teenager, I didn't quite pick up on this. Right. Right. But I think that a lot of the creation evolution debate really was at actually a theological level right. um, and a meta story level. Like is life purposeful, right? Uh, does morality have some higher source? Um, uh, d should I understand humans as having some guiding purpose that I should orient myself to? Or is this whole show meaningless? Is it arbitrary and, and sort of nihilistic and those sorts of things? But we are using, we are arguing about those ideas by arguing about genes and Adam and Eve and how penguins yeah. got to Antarctica and stuff like that. But really, the argument that we are having was at this upper layer. And when people who might not be very scientifically educated at all, they can still smell some right. of the metaphysical baggage right. in an idea and know that that doesn't fit with their metaphysical ideas, even if they're not very highly trained or haven't thought about these things in a deep level, humans have sort of a gut intuition on those sorts of things. And I think that's really what was going on. And like you said, th these debates aren't dead, but they were at a much higher pitch and much more central in the culture yes. war about 20 yeah. years ago than they are now. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said uh, uh, metaphysical baggage because now I know I can say such things. Um, <clears throat> but yes, the metaphysical baggage in these conversations, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and I think what's important for me, now this was not in the book that we're talking about right now, but I have another book I did with Cambridge University Press uh, called Biblical Philosophy, where I do actually argue from the biblical literature that the biblical authors were very tuned into the issue of randomness and chance and they actually frame what we call miracles. Of course, they don't have a word for miracle in the biblical languages, uh, but they call them signs and wonders. But they frame them in such a way against a null hypothesis of chance. Um, mm -hmm. 
And they're the only people in antiquity who do that, right? So a lot of the principles of scientific thinking actually come directly from the Hebrew Bible. I'm, I, I deal mostly with the Hebrew Bible, and there are a little bit of the New Testament. But my thesis is if you can get it, if you can get it going in the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament usually just extends the project uh, for the most part. So, uh, but and, and the you know the mirror, the signs and wonders of Jesus are contingent upon signs and wonders thinking against chance as a null hypothesis. Uh, well, I don't know if it's actually a null hypothesis. It's it's tested against chance. We'll put it that way. Some yeah, yeah. colloquial metaphysical sense of chance, like how could that have happened? And so they're very tuned into this this problem. So we, we can talk about randomness and metaphysics of randomness on one side, uh, but the biblical authors are actually, in, in some ways, at least at a folk level, thinking about these things and making sure to write so that you know that what they're talking about was not something that could have happened at chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Sort of like Gideon in the fleece is oh, sort that's, of a that's very one very specific, good example. Yeah. But but I could I could list a dozen that that Gideon the fleece is kind of like uh, maybe the most poignant version of it. But you have the same thing going on throughout. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, where where there is this concept that uh, amazing or hard to make sense of things could come about through processes that aren't a sign or a wonder. Um, right. And so one needs to be careful not to overinterpret or see signs and wonders in the wrong places. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they like with everything, the biblical authors have a very sober view of reality, even views of unnatural events that we call they call signs and wonders. They still want to restrain you and say, hey, hey, this isn't everything. You can't just claim your God did something because it was an ice storm in Egypt that actually happens every once in a while naturally. You know, so you uh -huh. can't just say this was God. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. So one thing that um, happened to me, so like I mentioned, I'm a, a statistician, although I work a lot in kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning, oh, especially cool. as applied to healthcare. Um, okay. And so one thing that I noticed is that there is a type of algorithm that you can use to train a very large machine learning model. Because imagine a machine learning model, you've got like hundreds of parameters that are trying to take variables that are inputs and maximize the accuracy of guessing the output, right? Hmm. Does this patient have cancer or not? Or something right. like that. And I've got all of their labs and medical history turned into discrete variables. And so I've hmm. got a whole bunch of parameters that are trying to maximize the probability that I guess correctly or something like that. And so it's a very mathematically difficult problem to train the parameters to do that. And sometimes, depending on the model type, it, they're, they're, you can't just follow a mathematical formula to say, here's what the optimal per, mm. uh, setting is for all of these hundreds of parameters. There's no explicit formula that you can use. Instead, what you have to do is you take a, a version of the parameters, you grab one of them, you tweak it with a random or well, a pseudo random number, right. and you'd be like, well, did this make it better or not? Oh, it made it better. Great. We're, we'll keep that change. Okay, oh. let's grab another parameter in the model. We'll give it a random tweak. Oh, so you're that didn't mimicking make it better. like point gene mutation kind of model. Yes. There. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. and what's interesting is that the randomness, and again, like whether whether this is like true randomness and what we would think of, like in these computer models, what you do is you take the like the the clock on on the computer and it's like oh yeah 20th digit <laughs> and right. multiply it by some prime numbers and divide it by right. some other prime numbers and that's your random number so it's which accurate. can always be found out as non-random like right and like they've tried all of these natural noise you know measuring a leaf you know flapping in the wind out in virginia and then put you know yes but you can they can always figure out when it's uh there are there are actual well you know there's uh there's calculations you can do to say how random a number right. sequence is, right? Yeah. Yes. And so this is random <laughs> enough for our right. purposes. Yeah. But I was thinking, I'm like, A, this is very similar to evolution, where right. you uh, do a little bit, you know, you've got one generation of settings of the parameters with some small mutations, and then you test it. And if it, if it survives or fits, I guess you could say better, then it survives. And if it doesn't, then you kill it off, yeah. basically. And then like you could sometimes even have uh, about 10 or 12 versions of this going in parallel. Hmm. And what's interesting is that you would often hope that they would converge on the same answer. Hmm. So you have you have 10 or 12 versions that are doing this in completely unconnected uh, with each other. And if they arrive at very similar parameter settings, then that's comforting that right. you would be like, I converged on the right answer. 
but the randomness or the pseudo randomness was useful. <laughs> you needed it in yeah. order to do this process. And, I was, and that made me think randomness is not just this inconvenient nihilistic thing. Yeah, no. It can be a useful tool that can allow you properly harness to accomplish something like an optimization algorithm that you couldn't do otherwise. And then also very interestingly, we expect these things to converge on the same answer. Yeah. And that that also connected me. I'm like, that's very similar to convergent evolution, There's where all, different all organisms on different on continents yeah. will turn out looking very similar as long as they're answering the same clear biological question. Anyway, I'll pass it back to yeah, you. Yeah, no, I and I, oh, I love the phrase random enough. I'm going to, I might have to, you might have to copyright that because, <laughs> sure. uh, I I but it, that, I mean, that is the issue is, is, is it's random enough. It's a useful tool. I would, I would tweak your language a little bit and say, it reminds you of evolution. I would say that reminds me of natural selection. Yes. Uh, and I think this is part of, not, not that you're part of the problem, but this, me too, uh, it was actually a friend of mine, Josh Swamidas, who wrote a book on um, uh, bio biological genealogical uh, evidence or how you could work out Adam mm. and Eve in the garden and still have evolution. Uh, but he read my manuscript and he's like, quit saying evolution where you actually mean natural selection. And this is what sure. Christians and apologists do all the time, say evolution. They actually, and, I, and the reason that's important is because I don't think any Christian, I don't even care if you're a seven day literal creationist. I don't think anybody should object to the idea of natural selection being true and mm. verifiable and empirically, you know, you can see, I mean, we, you can read studies today where, uh, where it is true. And actually it's, it's truer in a faster way than we've even known before. So these famous Fox experiments in Russia yeah. where they assume that it would take thousands of years and, uh, hundreds of generations of foxes to make these physiological changes turns out it took like 12 generations within 40 years uh, to change the physiology of a fox by by manually selecting them right mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you know like if we're gonna have a, a theological fight you know we're gonna move it up and down between the theology and the data uh, let's at least uh, sideline the fight let's not step on landmines we don't need to uh, and let's step on the ones that we actually need to and see how badly they explode um, and so I think we can talk about this, and I think you're right to say natural selection, yes. Evolution is is usually talking about the larger forces at work, genetic drift, and which I don't talk about genetic drift at all or gene flow at all in this um, for several reasons. But one is it just kept the it kept the conceptual worlds comparable between Darwin and and the biblical authors. Um, and say, okay, that's, you know, and I don't think most Christians would necessarily have problems, no matter what your view of Genesis is with uh, gene flow and gene drift. I, I, what I identify in the book as the, the biggest conceptual problem is that the, the uniformity of nature over time is that the biblical authors believe that natural and nature meant something metaphysically different mm -hmm. at some point in history. It will mean something different in the new heavens and new earth, and that we're in this in-between time where natural is means contorted, warped, uh, corrupted, cancerous, you know, uh, all the problems you work on would be it, uh, the issues of the unnatural world in its present state. Uh, but that will, again, be righted. So I think that the biblical authors would be, in my view, a little bit uh, tendentious about saying, hey, the world has always been this way. It's always going to be this way. And all of our theory and all of our theories are going to be premised on the fact that physics and energy have always worked the exact same as they do now. Now, uh, as a honest, sober science scientist, you can't <laughs> you can't right. say like, oh, the, the world used to be metaphysically different. It's going to be metaphysically, even if you're a Christian who's a scientist, uh, I don't think you that should necessarily affect your science other than what I do at the very end of the book, whereas I try to find some uh, ways in which the present physical world might have indications of reorientation. Um, yeah. Yeah. But the actual work of science, you know, the things you do, I think, has to deal with the world as we find it. Not the, I mean, I think this is the world. This is what the biblical authors would say. This is the world we're living in. Uh, there's something better coming, but this is the one that we have right now. So we need to deal with it soberly. Right? Yeah. So I'm going to take what might seem like a little bit of a left turn. I, I listened to a couple of your interviews and I noticed that in the book you talk a fair amount about sex. I'll, and but I haven't heard anyone ask you too much about this, so uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna push you on this. So my my basic understanding is that yes, we should understand. I, I'm pretty much some version of a theistic evolutionist, although 
a lot of theistic evolutionary Christians that I hear, I'm like, oh, I'm not that kind. Or uh, <laughs> this is or, part of the problem. Yeah, <laughs> this is the part of the problem. And like, well, do we I need to theistic create... evolutionists as as if it's one as if it's one blob, and everybody has the same right. kind of ideas floating around. In the right. Blob. And I read Francis Collins. I'm like, well, no, not like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but generally, I I agree at a high level that I think that God we can see God as having created through evolution and that we don't, it's an error, uh, an unnecessary error to view evolution as unguided or random or meaningless or right. purposeless. And in fact, it's impossible to really have any meaningful con uh, conversation about how evolution or natural selection works while ignoring purpose. I right. think that that is probably the greatest misconception in sort of popular talks about evolution is to say that it's purposeless when all it does is explain why things are accomplishing purposes. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 every single time. Well, why are polar bears white? Polar bears are white for the purpose of sneaking mm -hmm. up on seals in their very white Arctic environment. You know, why does this animal reproduce in this way? Well, for the purpose of. It, it's just right. every single thing that you say about evolution is that it was conformed to its environment through natural selection to accomplish a purpose. And so I think that that sort of, it, it's honestly a way of almost like reverse smuggling Aristotelian final cause back oh, into yeah. our, our conversations about science oh, in a point. way that yeah. had sort of been banished. Um, but then when it comes to things, so I, so I would say I'm perfectly fine saying that God uh, creates through the process, uh, through the process of natural selection and evolution, and that his. And then you got to my sex chapter, <laughs> and then I got to your sex chapter, and it's like, well, there there are going to be some problems with this because yeah. then we would basically have to say that almost everything that evolves is good, uh, and that it's moving in the direction of God's purposes, and it's natural. So then, how do how do we have a how do we explain evil or how do we explain things that have come to be through evolution that we might not like mm -hmm. and those sorts of things? And I feel like human sexuality is perhaps the most, I don't know, touchy subject when it comes to that. So do you want to explain a little bit what your, yeah. your thoughts are on, on human sexuality and yeah. uh, evolution and uh, theology? It was definitely the most depressing chapter to write. Um, I don't know why I thought it was just going to be interesting you know but uh the more i got into it the more i was like oh this is not what i thought was going on in evolutionary um, biology partly that was because um uh sexual assault what we would call sexual assault between humans is called forced copulation between uh animals um and and i didn't know like it just had never occurred to me until i was reading this literature that uh forced copulation is a problem where you have uh, what they call sexual dimorphism, where you have one animal, one sex is bigger than the other, right? We, you have the whole problem in evolution that we have two different sexes, male and female, which is an embarrassment for evolutionary biology because it should have never happened and they wish it would have never happened. And mm -hmm. so evolution, you know, most evolution is based on sexual reproduction, which is in a highly inefficient uh, way of, uh, inefficient and fatalist way of, of tapering species. So, uh, but where you have, typically where you have females, 99% of animals, females are bigger than males. Um, that, uh, but that doesn't usually end up in forced copulation in, in most animals. Uh, and a few animals, the males are uh, bigger and stronger than the females, which creates, uh, which, and, and because as Darwin noticed, males always seem to be more, much more interested in sex than females, right? Um, when we were at the zoo in Guatemala with my kids once, and my, they were little, like elementary age, and there was like two chipmunks going at it in a cage or something. And, uh, the, you know, they're like, which one's the boy and which one's the girl? My daughter said this. And I was like, oh, the boy is definitely the one in back. Um, and she goes, he looks so serious. <laughs> I was like, I was like, yeah, that's a, that's probably a general truth. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and then I hit this, I hit this, you know, where Darwin just like, it doesn't matter what species we look like, the males seem to be so much more intent on having sex. Right. Um, so it's not a problem as I'm, I'm, I'm moralizing this whole story I'm telling here, but it's not a problem per se but until you hit hominids where you have sexual, sexually dimorphic features between males and females. 
So you have males who are much more interested and much more willing to spend energy uh, being sexually aggressive. And now with hominids, they have the, the strength, the power and the size mm -hmm. um, to overcome females. So, and I heard somebody recently giving a lecture here on, on Hope College campus where I'm at now, um, where they talked about God using the exquisite tools of evolution to fine tune humanity into what he always wanted it to be and sent his son Jesus to kind of as an imprimatur on, on what humanity had become. And I have, having just, you know, researched and written this book, I was just like, uh, the exquisite tools of evolution to fine tune hum humans, excuse me. Like that is not how I think most, um, most humans would understand the data on forced copulation. Mm -hmm. So, so that to me created a, a, a pretty significant stumbling block with just casually saying, um, evolutionary processes are guided by God. And, and that's how he used to, to get us to some final state. And then you have the other issue, like which, which human like creature did he point out and say, you're okay. Now you're a Mago Dei or is the whole process a Mago Dei? You know, I think we could be open to lots of different theological possibilities here. Um, but even if you figure that one out, you still have this, or you end up doing kind of what the feminist and, and very early critiques of Darwin when they said, does this have to be all competition and death driven? Couldn't it be cooperative? And they try to find examples of cooperation in, in nature. Um, it, you, so you end up telling stories like, oh no, um, all of this sexual activity that led to modern humanity, it was all just cooperative sex, right? And you're like, I don't know. Again, you that that smell you know i don't know all the biological ins and outs but that doesn't smell right to me from what i know about humans and my you know yeah. my few years of experience on the planet so that to me was probably one of the larger stumbling blocks now maybe somebody is working on this or has worked it out and i just have not found their you know the argument yet but um and 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 i you know want to say the biblical authors you know forget about whether they're telling a historical story or not they're telling an origin story at the very least which some would call mythology, but not having to do with whether it's true or false. It's just an origin story, um, like a Marvel movie origin story. And they seem very, in, A, the biblical, especially Genesis. I'm just, I'm finishing Genesis right now with some sophomore classes. And, you know, of course, they're shook because of all the sexual assault and weird sex. Weird, girls, weird sex. Just yeah. lots of weird sex. Girls, I have, I have an article with Christianity <laughs> Today called What's Up With All The Weird Sex in Genesis, yeah. right? Um but they seem very, and they're portraying it as universally negative as well, right? So, uh, you know, polygamous relationships, daughters roofing their dad to get him drunk so they can have, like, it's understandable because they're doing it for survival, but it's not, it's not, it's looked down upon. It's expressly forbidden later in the Torah. Uh, almost every sexual behavior in Genesis is expressly forbidden in Leviticus 18. Mm -hmm. um, you can almost put the name of people from Genesis right next to every law on, on sexual behavior. So, um, so, but they seem to have a very clear-eyed intent to describe a world in which sexual assault is does, is a non-necessary part of the world. So, again, this is the subtitle is something like comparing the conceptual worlds of evolution in, in the Bible. But this is one of those conceptual differences where they actually seem to believe there is a way the world can exist, and maybe even a way that the world did exist in their minds uh, mm -hmm. that had no necessary sexual assault and no actual sexual assault. Um, and now because of problems in the world, a fundamental misorientation of humans to the earth, to other creatures, to each other, to God, uh, that creates the conditions that sexual assault is, uh, not necessary, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's, what do you call it? It's, it's rampant, but not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So like when we look at the human sex drive, there is a lot of dark things in there. Right. You, you talked about sexual assault. You could also talk about infidelity. Um, right. Like yeah, monogamy is you know, weird. <laughs> monogamy is weird. Like women, you know, when they're at the peak of their fertility cycle right. are more likely to have thoughts and fantasies yep. uh, or actions of infidelity, but not when they're off. Yep. Men, like if you get a, an attractive college girl to go up to random guys on campus and say, hey, would you like to come back to my dorm room with me? You know, 80 or 90 percent of guys will say yes. Yep. Uh, like less than one percent of girls will say yes when the genders were first. Like, uh, and, you know, pedophilia, all sorts of weird and dark things are in 
the human sex drive. And a lot of them seemingly have evolutionary explanations right. for why they would, in some sense, make sense and have some sort of adaptive value. So then that, that I think, provides a very difficult theological question for a theistic evolutionist, or really, I mean, any sort of person. Yeah, but it's particularly, a problem for all of us. Yeah, It's a problem for everyone, but it's a particularly poignant problem for a theistic evolutionist who wants to say that God is in charge of this process and that it is moving towards God's foreordained good ends. Mm -hmm. But then why is it building within us all of these dark things? And so I, I how do you make sense of that? I don't. I mean, I... I you know, this book project probably led me into some special form of agnosticism, <laughs> of mm -hmm. uh, curious ag agnosticism on both evolutionary exp explanation. I've been saying, you know, th this is again my own, you know, my own my own intuitions at work here. But reading across a lot of the literature, I feel like that uh, evolutionary biologists and psychologists are seem to be very aware that the explanations don't fully work. You know, kind of like physicists. Who are like, we don't know how to explain anything at the quantum level. This is Sean Carroll's article in the New York Times. We can't explain anything at the quantum level. And worse, we're not even trying to. You know, we're, we've just given up on trying to explain it at all. And he's a very famous Stanford physicist, right? And I think evolutionary biologists and psychologists have not gotten there yet. There was a little war that sprung up in the late 90s that I remember listening to on NPR, you know, uh, in the 90s where these guys wrote this book on the history of rape. And they basically said, hey, rape is kind of a genetically encoded feature. And there were some into, uh, in, in, uh, implications that can we really hold all males all the time responsible for sexual assault when they really are, in, in some real way from a biological perspective, acting on uh, genetically encoded uh, yeah. impulses, right? And like guys are way more likely to rape someone outside their own cultural group than inside their own cultural group or um, mm. acts of war during times of war. Oh yeah. War. And, yeah. and, and that sort of thing and conquest. Uh, yeah. And like, you know, it, it's, it's really in there and you know, how do you deal with that? Yeah. And so I, I think, I think nobody ha has dealt with it. I don't think anybody in evolutionary biology thinks they have like somehow crack the nut here and made it all coherent i've been telling i've been saying basically i i feel like we are on the cusp of an einsteinian revolution like 50 years from now there's there may be some new paradigm that can pull a lot more of this together but right now it's like islands of explanations like mathematics right you got different mm -hmm. forms and fields of mathematics can't be unified uh there's people who try but then you know i don't know if they're given up or not but I feel like the, the these the, the islands of explanation haven't been pulled together into an archipelago yet, and that's yeah. uh, and that's what I'm waiting to see, um, yeah. which is why I'm curiously agnostic about a lot of it. Um, yeah. So I uh, a, a person an evolutionary biologist I enjoy listening to is Brett Weinstein, and he has some interesting things to say. But I've noticed sort of a pattern when he talks about evolution is that he often judges it to be morally evil, basically. Hmm. He will say the process of evolution is like a cosmic spelling bee that ends in genocide or something like that, hmm. where there is like, like evolution desires evil and therefore we need to use our reason, which like evolution accidentally oh, okay. gave us yeah. to transcend all of our bad programming from the past. And I've noticed that his straight story, out of late 1880s, man, that guy. Right. It, it, <laughs> and it that story has a lot of similarities to almost like a Gnostic cosmology. Yeah. That that there is this bad thing that yep. has made us and it has bad evil goals, but our mind or our spirit somehow are from a higher yeah. realm yeah. and we need to use this thing that's higher to fight this thing that's lower. But then Man, you it's have like great connective insights. Like that's a, I would have never thought of it that way, but that's a really, really good connection. Well, I appreciate that, but I'm, I'm wondering how to escape his quandary because I feel <laughs> like, like I can be like, well, man, there's so much good in evolution and a lot of our kindness and the things that we do like and, um, the love between a husband and a wife and the affection that parents have for their children and all of these things, all of these also have very clear evolutionary explanations. And so there's a well, lot I'm of I'm not things. convinced they have clear evolutionary explanations, actually. <laughs> I, you know, I think monogamy 
uh, lifetime. I mean, you know, even things I point out in the sex chapter that for most mammals, I I think it's mammals, but it may be for wider animalia. But for most manual, mammals, the the physical health, emotional, if you even talk about animals having emotions, the benefits of the male partner mating, staying, and raising those children uh, go up the more the male is willing to do that. And specifically, the male is willing mm -hmm. to do that. Um, but how could a male ever know that in an evolutionary process? Yeah. Like, like uh, there, like there's, or how could an instinct ever drive staying over time and circumstance where there would be all kinds of reasons not to stay, mm -hmm. uh, reasons to leave, pressures to leave, pressures to keep copulating el elsewhere, like that? Uh, so maybe uh, I, I don't want to suggest there's a moral. I don't want to go the other route and say there's like a moral gnosticism. Like our morality will overcome the evil of good, right? Yeah. Um, but that that the biblical authors are actually very in tune to this problem. And suggest a completely different metaphysical answer. Um, sure. And, what do you and, what 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 do you think that is? Well, that the nature of reality itself is misoriented, and that mm -hmm. um, and that the proper orientation is habituation in a particular type of community. I would say science is your closest paradigm to what's going on in, in the biblical community. The scientific community is like, in some ways, a parallel community to the the Hebrew community of the Old Testament. Mm. Um, so, and there are lots of anthropologists that actually who study scientists have found that to be the case as well. But yeah, so it's advocating for a community where individual ethics are not the issue. It's all y'alls, not yous, uh, mm. or you. Um, it's, a, it's a team sport for the maintaining per specific perspectives on justice and righteousness attuned to a persp specific perspective on human life, animal life. I mean, animal rights, you don't really get anywhere in the ancient world except for the Hebrew Bible. Um, that it's really trying to make you, and I, I argue this in some other books, and lots of people have argued this actually, that you know Genesis 1, 2, 3, what most people miss because they read the English is they miss how deeply connected humans are to animals, the earth, and to each other, and, and not to God in some ways. Uh, you know, the man is made from the dirt and given the breath of life and called a living creature, but so are all the animals that are created are also made from the dirt, also given the breath of life, also called living creatures. And he's put in direct relationship with them by naming them and differentiating them and then discovering uh, his wife, who is not made from the dirt, but is made from him. Right. So this male and female thing with humans goes to some different level than it does with animals who are all animals and humans alike are blessed to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So they're they're in tune that there's a kind of a different north star that is not for individuals it's for communities and there are certain types of community rituals behaviors that lead to proper understanding of the world around you and there and it's not a question of whether you're going to understand the world around you it's how well you're going to understand it um you, you're either going to be poorly formed to understand it or properly formed um and in, even after they leave Eden, proper formation still has inherent problems because everything, you know, the ground is working against you. Uh, people become wicked in various ways. You know, in, in the story of Genesis, people not only become wicked uh, and violent and ruin the earth, but they live for hundreds of years. Yeah. So they become apparently pretty wise in their wickedness, you know, according to that story. Um, so, yeah, I think they just have a completely different orientation. One that I think when you hear it described, you know, without all the religious terminology that hangs up a lot of people, you say like, oh, yeah, OK, that sounds that sounds a lot like social justice movements. What social justice movements are trying to do, but in a wonky sort of way and through legal apparatus or social political apparatus today that kind of constrains them. Um, but it seems like very similar intentions uh, of and it's not happy, slappy, kumbaya, we're all going to get along and that's what's going to make the world great. It's actually by uh, very carefully dealing with deep evils, excising those from the community. I mean, there are capital punishments for lots of things, as you know, in, in the in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Um, but uh, I always have to point out, I'm writing a book on biblical law right now, so I have to point out, you can get executed for twice as many things in the United States today as you can in, in the Hebrew Bible. So <laughs> huh. if you want to talk about, like, because they're like, oh, they kill you for everything. I'm like, do they? Really? I looked it up and started comparing them. So... Um, Technically, you can, get, fact. you can get executed for, and if you go back to the 70s or 50s in the United States, it's it's even more, right? Because rape, yeah. uh, rape would have been an executionable offense. Um, there's some other little ones that are executionable. So, um, 
yeah so they they have a you know they have an entire construct for what it means to live as a people um in which they acknowledge evil they acknowledge that uh evil is not a thing it's an orientation right this is the other problem god does evil in in the hebrew bible lots of times right he commits evil against israel he commits evil against egypt and, and i'm saying that in the sense of that's the language of the hebrew that he commits evil um he causes evil to happen it's not just that he allows it to happen he's the causative force of it but that's but evil and good again is not a gnostic or a zoroastrian view of evil and good where they're opposite forces and something is either evil and is good and twixt and twain it can't be they don't have that view of evil and good they have a a more like flourishing view of good and a deleterious cancerous view of of evil um, yeah which is somewhat almost uh similar to darwinism <laughs> yeah well exactly i mean yeah. there's a whole there was a whole book that i had to restrain myself from not writing in between the pages <laughs> here of, of good and evil and all the problematic views of good and evil that that modern people bring to these mm -hmm. texts and because then the, you most people freak out when they hear god does evil and they're like how is that even possible? And I'm like, well, look, you may be bothered by that, but the biblical authors weren't. Um, and they, they have, I think they have a better view of good and evil and truth and false than we do. And, um, and it's so, it, as you point out, good and evil, it sounds much more like Darwin, their view of true and false. If you, if you want a biblical view of what truth and falsity means today, the best working definition of it is the one that the scientists use. Something mm -hmm. that is uh, something that is what we think it is over time and circumstance. When we test it over time and circumstance, it holds up to what we thought it was going to be, and that's basically the biblical view of truth. <clears throat> and false just means it's not reliable. No. It's an unreliable theory. It's an unreliable idea. It's an unreliable tent peg. It's an unreliable road. Right? They can talk about false roads, true roads, true tent pegs, false tent pegs, etc. So they're just this is that subtitle is doing a lot of work in this book. This is a conceptual sure. world, right? They yeah. they actually have their whole conceptual world, and the problem most Christians and Jews and all people who are you know Dawkins, all these people who read the Bible is they just drag their conceptual world and, and slot things one for one as if it works in that world. Um, and so I was trying to open up their concept. I was trying to do the thing that we all want to do is like, listen to, you know, like hear their voice, value their voice over your own conceptual world and see what they have to say and then see whether it makes any sense, uh, whether it could be possibly be true in today's world or if it's just like religion, old time Bible, Bible true. And if it's only true in the Bible, I'm not interested. I couldn't care less if it's true just in the Bible. But if they have truths that, permeate then uh you know then i'm i'm interested they got my ear yeah so i i quoted tertullian at the beginning what does athens have to do with jerusalem and i think an interesting point that you make is that in our western culture we often are like well the greeks were the smart thinky ones mm. and a lot of our ideas of truth especially math and science and stuff like that and, and really good philosophy come from them and the Jews or the, the Jerusalemites were the moral ones and our mm. ideas about God and morality come from them. And so we've got like thinky talky philosophy from Athens and um, <laughs> how to behave and how to worship God from Jerusalem. But a lot of your points are that um, the, the Greeks set a lot of stumbling blocks uh, in front of uh, math and science that sort Absolutely. of had to be exercised. And almost all of those times that, you know, we had to drop a Greek metaphysical idea to make progress in science, it moved more and more towards a Jewish idea. So do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, you summarized it pretty well. <laughs> pretty well. There. I like thinky talky. I'm going to quote you on that one, too. Um, yeah. I, you know, it. I think. And, and even, you know, you go ask something like where does America get its ideals about humanity, the equality of humans, the equal treatment of humans under the law, you know, democracy, one man, one vote, which obviously isn't how it works, but you know, but close enough, it's a good enough story. Um, and, and people are going to say the Greeks and the Romans, right? And you go to Washington DC and it actually, the architecture itself tells you this, it's all Romanesque architecture, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what Hebrew architecture would look like, honestly, <laughs> Iron Age Hebrew architecture, but um, yeah, but in truth, like almost all of those ideals come straight out of the Hebrew Bible. And I'm, this is not me arguing. This has been well argued by many good scholars. Uh, but this, this come from the Hebrew Bible and, and explicitly they don't come from Greco Roman culture, right? Uh, like there's no world in Greece or Rome in which, or ancient Greece and Rome in which 
humans are treated equally just because they're humans. I mean, that's like the most foreign idea to Greco-Roman society you could possibly think of, right? Um, they would think that that was anathema. And and so, you know, I, I want to push philosophy and just say, whenever we say philosophy, we're really talking about theology. So why can't you have zero in a number system? Well, you know, I mean, you're a math guy, you know, zero didn't exist. And then it did for the Sumerians. They seem to have a placeholder in their sesamagesimal number system called zero, or it wasn't called zero, it was a null number. Um, it disappears with the Sumerians and pops up again, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Uh, and, and then engineering explodes and, and uh, science also along with math and engineering explode. Well, it wasn't because zero is a problem mathematically. It actually turns out to be a very helpful tool, kind of like randomness. It turns out to be a very helpful tool in, in doing all kinds of mathematical problems. I don't know math at all. So I'm just speaking from what I've read from philosophers of math. <laughs> um, but it was a theological problem for Hellenistically influenced uh, thinkers. So if you think that numbers exist in the heavens, triangularity exists in the heavens, eternal unchangeable forms, well, you can't have an eternal unchangeable form of nothing. That's a theological problem for ancient Greece. Uh, but we pulled a lot of ancient Greece forward into our thinking, and we held on to their theological problems. Galileo classically uh, rejected elliptical orbits of the planets because he believed circles were the only uh, truly divine form of movement, right? And so if God set up the planetary movement, God had to make it a circle because God, you know, is circular. Um, and then, you know, Kepler uh, tries to show him the math doesn't work and that elliptical orbits looks better. But Kepler too, this is Michael Polanyi points this out, but Kepler also wasn't right. Uh, he was closer, but he wasn't correct. His, his calculations didn't actually work out fully. Um, because he was a Neoplatonist and he was convinced that the goodness of ratios over Aristotle's circularity. And so el ellipses represented ratios better than uh, circularity. So they're all, these people are all having theological arguments based on dogma that was handed to them by non-biblical non sources. Um, and once, and of course, this is, the this is the wonderful story about the scientific enterprise, is it eventually, if it doesn't work, they do eventually drop it, you know? Unlike pastors with, you know, programs or whatever, uh, like if it just doesn't work, they drop it. Um, and then you just say, well, where do they end up after they've dropped that idea? Um, they end up in what I think most people would call kind of a critically real view of reality. There, there is some kind of objective world that we are all subjects within. Even if we don't believe objective and subjective are real things, they're good enough descriptions to help us understand our orientation to the things around us. Um, and this is the key thing that I think is the Hebrew insight that that mo almost almost no other culture, religion, or philosophy uh, begins with is that creation itself, because God has some causative agency in creation, has the right to tell us about creation. In the same way that Sam Tideman has the right to really tell me about himself, even though I might see things in you that you can't even see, but but you have the right to tell you, like, if I say, like, are you a philanderer? You'd be like, no. And let me tell you why I'm not a philanderer. I'm assuming you're not a philanderer for the sake I, of I, I, I hope not. No, I, okay. I, um, I, I'm not. <laughs> which, as a young man, I confuse with philanthropist way too often. So. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and so that move that creation is real, it's objective to us. And I don't mean in some kind of canny way. It's like objectively true or whatever. I just mean there's something out there and it has the it has agency in the sense that it, we can put ideas to it and it can tell us we're wrong. That's a very uniquely this is the old University of Chicago um, Orientalist called this the skeptical mood of the Hebrew scripture that's unique to the Hebrew scripture and the critical intellectualism that the real world can be tested and the real world has the right to speak back about what's real and what's not. And that's the basis for all scientific inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, if you begin with Platonism or Brahminism, maybe less so with Confucianism, but a little bit with Confucianism as well, uh, as just some examples, um, you're beginning with the premise that none of this is real. Your body is deceptive. Your senses are deceptive. And the, and the sooner you get, get over the fact that none of this is actually real and that everything that you know is dece de deceit, the better you will know reality. Mm -hmm. um, there is no world in which that conceptual scheme leads you to science. And I would say, and then you say, well, wait, didn't the Greeks do science? I'm like, yes, of course, the Greeks and the Romans did science and engineering. I mean, we, you've seen some of their architecture, right? They know how to do engineering. How do they do that? Well, they didn't do calculations in Roman numerals. 
They had like scratch boxes where they go over to mathematicians who used an entirely different pragmatic, realistic system of mathematics to do all their calculations. And they hand them the numbers and that's what they do. It'd be impossible to do it with Roman numerals, right? You don't mm -hmm. have pieces of paper or, you know, you don't have a, what do you call it? Marble slabs big enough to do math <laughs> in Roman numerals, right? So uh, it's a little bit of the mythology of the West. I'm waiting on, I, you know, a couple people have written, there's a great book. If somebody wants like more on this, it's more than this, but um, this, Nicholas Spencer's Magisteria, he, it's not his intent to talk about this at all. He just keeps mentioning how Greek theology keeps getting dropped off again and again and again uh, as, as science kind of works its way more towards what some might call a critical realism or something like a critical realism, even if they're anti-realist in philosophy of science, you probably still have a critically real bent to you in, in your in your scientific mm -hmm. work. Sure. I want to be respectful of your time. So last question, what projects do you have coming up next? Oh, um, so I'm I'm actually getting ready to direct. This is it's nothing signed yet, but it's like a 99%. Um, I'm going to be directing a project uh, at Oxford uh, on creation and evolution amongst Muslim, Christian, and Jewish scholars. Uh, for for a few years, so that'll keep me busy for the next three or four years, and then um, I'm working on a book for Baker Academic on how to understand biblical law apart from Greek legalism. Greece Greece is not the enemy; like they're just doing their thing, right? I just want to be clear. It's mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of interesting things about Greek philosophy and all kinds of things to discover. Aristotle is everybody should read Aristotle at some point in their life. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things going on there. However. It is a problem when you take Greek legal thinking and a reverse apply it to Iron Age Hebrew uh, law and, and instruction, because then you come up with ideas like, oh, laws are rules where you either break or keep them. And if you break them, then you get punished. Well, that's not at all the scheme of biblical law. So um, the book is meant to help people not make basic mistakes in understanding biblical law. It's like it's not trying to make you an expert reader. It's just like a short book to be, hey, like if you just quit doing these things or you looked at law this way from within its own culture and categories, uh, it will make so much more sense. And you'll think and you'll see it as much less. You, you will no longer be able to look at biblical law as a brutal, brutish, punishment oriented uh, system. You'll actually look at it entirely as justice oriented for the vulnerable. It's essentially the reorientation that happens. So, All right. Well, Dr. Drew Johnson, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed talking with you, and uh, maybe we'll have to talk again sometime. Yeah, I really hope so. You had fantastic questions, and I feel like I've learned a lot from, <laughs> from you. Well, I appreciate that. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone, for listening.